Hi, everybody. This is Alan Fine, and I'm here with Gavin Landry, who's Visit Britain's executive vice president and director of the Americas overseeing North and South America. We have a lot to talk about, uh, especially with news from the EU, uh, news from Britain itself, news from the U.S. How do you keep track of it? In fact, we need a travel advisor to be the geopolitical advisor and medical advisor of everyone. And so we're going to talk about that and more on Insider Travel Report. Uh, let's do a refresher. Um, let's talk about uh, Visit Britain, what you oversee, and, and the job drop and, and how we're now going to bring it all back. So as you know, Alan, and good to see you, by the way, um, Visit Britain is the National Tourism Office for Great Britain. And we were formed in 1969. So you can imagine that over 50 years ago, that was quite a prescient move on behalf of the British government to think about tourism as a major part of the economy and as an industry itself. That precedes the really the launch of the jumbo jet that is before Disney and or Orlando was built. Um, I, had, and, I had no idea. That, that that's right. Really impressive. And, Destinations, uh, you know, like visit California, visit Hawaii, weren't even uh, inklings in anyone's in anyone's eye at that time. So, <clears throat> this is a very um, important responsibility we hold to drive, you know, Britain's visitor economy. Uh, Pre-pandemic, the uh, the magnitude of, of Britain's uh, tourism economy was quite 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 large. Uh, you're talking about 3.1 million jobs, uh, about 112 billion annual economic impact and over 200,000 SMEs, small to medium-sized employers. So it's a very important part, 10% of G GDP. I don't know if I said that, but this is a really big industry for, for tourism. And so we're really um, you know, getting behind the recovery efforts. And I look forward to talking with you about that. Okay, so we put off this interview because we knew that things were gonna open up on Monday, the 17th of May, and they did. But what's interesting about that is, uh, you know, it's not that international travel opened then, uh, you, you had to have an essential reason. Uh, and now you don't have to have an essential reason, but the, the, the blockade is still, you got to be tested, right? You got to, there's still a lot to do. Can you explain what, what has happened since the 17th? Sure. So let me just tell you that England, Scotland, and Wales have all outlined their own roadmaps, uh, which interestingly now are starting to sync up as the vaccination oh. programs have, have taken hold and taken effect. That's really good, good, good news. On May 17th, the government did uh, reopen hospitality. This has been kind of a phase reopening, um, but things you know like pubs and restaurants and so on and so forth, accommodation have all been put into the mix again as of the 17th. And so, the, so you, can, you can be indoors now for those. That's right. You can be indoors. Um, some social distancing uh, regimes do stay intact, uh, but but frankly, it's just good to have you know these the, the reopening occurring, and of course there'll be review dates uh, at at the end of June, another review date at the end of July, and another review date in September uh, for in terms of just what the regimes and the, and the protocols might be. I will tell you, Alan, the UK government's pr priority remains to protect the public and the vaccine rollout from international coronavirus variants of concern. So starting from this week, Monday, May 17th, England, Scotland, and Wales have implemented their new rules for international travel in line with the Global Travel Task Force recommendations that were made in April. The new travel rules follow a risk-based traffic light system. So green mean go, amber means slow, although when I'm driving, you know, yellow means speed up, right. uh, so you don't get caught by the red, and then red, of course, is red. Um, and different uh, protocols apply to each. Now, the initial traffic light system had um, you know, green is basically a no quarantine requirement. Uh, visitors still need to have testing, you know, pre-departure right. and while they're in the UK. Amber essentially meant it's just like it is now where you have a quarantine of 10 days upon arrival and then required testing. And red is basically a, a country that is too at risk for inbound international travel. So it would be of interest to this audience to know that both Canada and the U.S. are amber at the moment. Yes. Yeah, amber, amber at the moment. Amber. Right. But the, every three weeks. So what's important is the dates that I told you earlier, those are basically dates for domestic. Um, the dates in terms of reviewing the traffic light system and reviewing who's who's on this traffic light system are going to be re reviewed every three weeks. So you'll see a review of, of the May 17th decision on our, or about that first week in June. So that's good news. And we're very hopeful that the, you know, the U.S. and the U.K. can establish kind of a green green on both sides. Um, Canada is a little further behind the U.S. in terms of its um, programs, but is catching up very quickly. So we are very hopeful that there will be a North American travel component to the remainder of the, the late part of summer into early fall. But and it still seems like when, when you come in there, it, it, I mean, even if you have a vaccine, you'll still be tested. The vaccine isn't the, the, the final on any of this yet. 
Right. Well, I mean, uh, Britain is taking a country approach as opposed to an on an individual basis. And so because of that, it's based on what your country is in the traffic light system and how all that plays out. But of course, there are lots of ways that this can be iterated or changed. And one thing we've learned about this pandemic is that uh, the pace of change has just been, you know, boggling. In fact, last May, you remember we were opening you know, parts of America and thinking that, you know, we yeah. might we might have a fall and fall travel. And then, of course, you know, that all came to, to a close very fast. And, and the pandemic has hit, you know, second, third waves around the world. Um, but, you know, I think there's there's a lot of hopefulness uh, in terms of what's going on. And if anyone wants further details about the testing requirements and how to make arrangements, they can go to the UK government website, which is gov.uk. Can't be you, beat me to it. you beat me to it. I was going to say that because it is moving very quickly and we need a place for reference. So that's the one. Uh, and I'll superimpose it up there. Um, okay. Now, when are you scheduled to go back to Britain? You know, I don't have a schedule at the moment. I am very hopeful that I'll be able to go in person for our director's meeting in the fall. So that's kind of what I'm targeting myself. But uh, certainly if things open up earlier, uh, there's a good chance that I could be going back. I, I haven't seen my colleagues at work for, you know, since last March. And I know that a lot of people here have relatives, you know, over, over in the UK, haven't seen their families, haven't seen their friends. So we're all quite keen to get back to the UK. So now what's it going to look like? What's it going to be like traveling back um, Tourism and hospitality is taking a phased approach. Uh, what's open, what's not, mask rules, distancing. Uh, know before you go webpage. Let's talk about that too. Sure. Yeah. So, I mean, there's a couple of things going on. We are, the phased reopening is really how hospitality is, is going to be taking uh, back its, its, its industry over the next com coming months. And then June 21st is set as a date where the prime minister will actually talk about the uh, you know, sort of all the protocols and regimes around masks and social distancing. So that's the next kind of more most significant date from a domestic standpoint. There's also quite a bit of work going on within uh, Great Britain on domestic itself to try to recover domestic travel as a way to you know reopen the industry. So um, London and Partners is doing a massive campaign. I think one of the most the largest campaigns they've done, essentially promoting London to other parts of, of Great Britain. And then, of course, we also have a campaign that we're working on called Escape the Every Day with a side, a side component called Escape the Every Day um, Responsibly. And so we're, we're going to be focusing a lot on the domestic market in the early days of these phased reopenings. Now, we do know that anecdotally, many attractions opened um, with time ticketing last summer and other measures in place to, to manage visitor flow and maintain social distancing. Some attractions may keep those measures in place or continue to require advanced booking. What's interesting to know, Alan, and one of the things I guess you could call the silver lining of this terrible um, pandemic we've been going through, is that the technological advancements that the industry has made have been significant. So things like, it. right, so things like contactless um, uh, experiences, time ticketing, so that there's a, a really a benefit to the consumer and a benefit to the attraction um, that they can manage capacity. We, we weren't really very good. Uh, it's, I'd say using a British word, we were rubbish at capacity, <laughs> capacity management before this pandemic. And even when you talk about biometrics and movement of people, you know, through the airports and, and, and across borders, you know, the advancements are significant and they will remain in place, uh, particularly some of these contactless protocols that have just gone, you know, gone so far forward. Now, we also know that people need to have confidence in international travel. So we built a couple of, of programs around that very concept that it's hygiene and safety, that, uh, that getting there, being there and arriving there will all be positive experiences for the guests. So we've, we've got a program called Know Before You Go, which essentially will give you all the details on, an, on a live basis, real-time basis as to what uh, is required, uh, money-back guarantees in terms of cancellations uh, and things that would boost the confidence among American and Canadian travelers. And we also launched something called an industry. Sorry, if I remember correctly for the travel advisors listening, that if they go to your website, uh, uh, Visit Britain, it's, it's a uh, uh, link right at the top. That's right. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's a very good way to just kind of check in on what you might need in advance. And then, of course, either in advance or while you're in country, we've got a program called We're Good to Go. And this is essentially a confidence uh, reassurance program where various parts of the industry signed on. I think we have over 47,000 businesses that have signed on to We're Good to Go, where we issue this mark to them if they have gone through the proper certification which is all online certifications and it, and it, it all aligns with the government advice for various sectors. So accommodations has certain requirements, 
you know, attractions have another requirement, restaurants have another requirement. So they've signed on to this, we're good to go. And we've actually been recognized, which is, is something that I'm quite proud of, of the, of the team that worked on this, as by the w WTTC, which is the World Travel and Tourism Council, as a safe travel stamp. It's an internationally recognized safe travel stamp. There aren't too many of them out there. I think at last count, there may have been one or two in America that have this safe travel stamp. And it's, again, it's kind of a, a overarching global program that recognizes destinations that have adopted kind of standardized health and hygiene protocols. If someone wanted to know, for example, uh, after June, uh, whether they could go to the West End for, for a show, this is where they would look. They would look to see if it, it is a, a good to go certified uh, uh, theater. That's right. That's right. Good to go. Certified. What the what the social distancing guidelines that are in effect, and many you know it comes to the West End. Many of the shows have already announced you know their dates and their reopening, and it's a pretty good uh, number. I'm, I'm going to say it's in the na neighborhood of 12 or 15 shows that are talking about you know reopening in the fall. You know when it I comes to wicked, the shows. Sorry, I heard Wicked. I think I read that um, a bunch yeah. of them in New York as a, a parallel situation on Broadway. Right. And it, it, there are economic reasons why these shows, in some cases, can't reopen with a, a 20 percent capacity or 20 percent house. But when you start talking about a 50 percent house or a 70 percent house, that's when it becomes economically viable for them to open. You know, the good to go. It's just an extra layer of confidence that our right. industry is, is reopening, not only in line with UK government guidance, but in line with international standards. And what I would tell you is that um, one of the things we did experience when we were working on this program is that there were several countries that will go unnamed that announced similar programs, but essentially they were programs that were, uh, you know, in name only, I would say. There wasn't a whole lot behind They didn't them. have teeth like this one. They didn't have teeth. And without the teeth, then it's really not something that would reassure me as a traveler. And I'm really, really proud of, I think it's something along the lines of 500 pages or more, um, this, you know, uh, we're good to go you know, an industry standard that the, the folks have to sign on to. So it's not an easy lift for them to do, but it does provide a lot of confidence. And as we're talking about this new experience, uh, the, the trip home at this time, we we're still needing tests coming back. How easy is it for an American to get a test to return? Uh, nothing there really has changed. I, it, I think it's, um, there are more and more advancements being made by airlines. I'd see, I'd see that Delta announced, you know, rapid testing that's being introduced you know, for their, for their system. Uh, I think it's going to be, you know, as time wears on, you know, the, the American and Canadian audiences will have, you know, no issue in terms of when you come back home. It's really about the main concern of a lot of the guidelines with the UK is, is coming into the country. Um, and, and of course, we have, to, we have to have green on both sides. It has to be open green on both sides for, you know, for there to be uh, economic viability, yeah. frankly. The planes can't be half empty you know, one, one, one way and, and, and full the other way around. So it has to be, you know, it has to be a mutual agreement. Well, well let's talk about Aer Lingus, United, JetBlue. Uh, they're, they're starting to have routes. You're getting more lift. It, 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 that shows more optimism. Can you tell us what you know about that? That's right. I mean, we knew that these, these routes were coming online and they're just being timed around, you know, government, government advice. Uh, but we're very excited. You know, the JetBlue, in fact, it was in the news today about JetBlue and uh, there was a press release sh showing yes the equipment that they're using, as well as the um, the type of seating. And you're starting to look at seating in business class at, at around $1,550, uh, which in business class is is really a good deal. I think economy was around $550. And these are really nice pieces of metal. These are This is new equipment. So it's always good when you have players. Uh, Aer Lingus is flying into Manchester. Um, and as you know, our cities are, are really dependent upon inbound international travelers in order to, to maintain their, their tourism industry. So it's really, really good stuff that we've got going on. Very excited about that. And, and this is to support that pent up demand. Now, do you have a, I heard a sentiment, a sentiment tracker? That's right. We do. We run a sentiment tracker in, in about 17 different market markets. And what we found is that in America, as an example, 73% of respondents surveyed were said they were likely to take an international trip in the next 12 months. And one in two said they definitely would. So there is pent up demand. We know there's pent up demand. Uh, many Americans have future travel credits that are on the books where they had to cancel trips from you know with with their tour operator or their their travel advisor. And so they're they've got money on the books and they're ready to go, um, just waiting for the, the conditions to be right. We have we have done this tracker and, and rolled it along throughout the pandemic just to kind of have a really good view on how Canadians and Americans are feeling. Uh, one thing we do know is that a lot of folks that are keen to travel have not yet booked and not decided where to go. So this is a great opportunity for Britain and for travel advisors to inspire their clients to redeem 
their future travel credits for a trip to the UK this year. We also know that Europe was, a, was the most popular region for both American and Canadian travelers next international leisure, leisure trip. And within Europe, Britain was placed in a strong competitive position. I think we ranked uh, second or third when it came to uh, desirability and interest in going to, to Britain as soon as the conditions are right. And it was very similar for Canadians. The other thing that we found from our sentiment is that London is the most popular region of England for American and Canadian amount travelers to visit in the short term. And this is a key factor because London is the bright light, the jewel, uh, you know, the, and, and the crown jewels, uh, the gem and the crown jewels. It's really a, it's, it's a, a place that makes the engine and the whole thing go. And we are very keen to help London recover and become one of the greatest cities in the world again when it comes to, to tourism and what, what tourism contributes. But there's also the other, the out, outerlying areas and with sentiment being that they want space, I found it interesting to think that with the new uh, um, uh, uh, space rules, even in London, you're not going to feel crowded at this time. Yeah, that could very well be. I mean, I'll, I'll share an anecdote with you from my own personal experience. I'm a Yankees fan and um, we, Marie and I were lucky enough to go to, to Yankee Stadium recently and they were on 10% capacity at the time. And I have to tell you that the experience that I had at Yankee Stadium was very unique compared to, you know, past times. Um, I thought both were great, but, you know, in this case, you're talking about I got a much better seat. Um, it was easier to get a beer and a, and a hot dog. And, you know, I could hear, literally hear the players in the dugout talking about, you know, the pitch and the pitcher and what they were trying to do to have a That's successful nice. Yeah, it was really cool. So we think in some ways that, you know, as horrible as the pandemic has been, um, we think the advances that in, in terms of capacity management, in terms of, you know, time ticketing, touchless uh, experiences, things like that may actually contribute to an improved tourism experience down the road. Those are almost luxury uh, uh, traits, like having a time, having space. Space is a luxury. It's almost like it, it forced the travel industry to bring that luxury to the mask. Right. Exactly. I feel the same way. So um, these trends that you're seeing, uh, outdoor experiences and uh, screen tourism, let's talk about that. So we know that films and TV are powerful motivators for travel. And almost a third of potential visitors to the UK were excited to visit places they've seen on screen. So people lately have been watching uh, Bridgerton. I don't know if you, you've seen it yeah. yourself. Um, reading the whole Harry Potter series, catching up on the crown. And Bridgerton itself has received a lot of attention in the U.S. We've also seen that travelers want to go and have their own Bridgerton experience for themselves. So it's been fantastic because several tour operators are now building um, product and, and trade is the trade is responding to this demand by building, building out tours and experiences around a Bridgerton experience. The other good news we've gotten recently is that Downton Abbey, the movie, will be coming. Uh, the second Downton Abbey movie will be coming this Christmas. So we're just totally stoked and excited about that. So we get another chance to see High Clare Castle and so many other the homes and the filming locations. And that made a big, big pop in our, our, our travel and travel behavior when uh, Downton came out a little more than a year ago. And then, of course, we can't wait for Bond. You know, Bond film, No Time to Die, has been holding. It's been ready to go. James Bond is an iconic figure, and it's always a great example to showcase Britain on a global stage or screen. And then broadening out, I mean, uh, Britain is, is very vast. You also have Game of Thrones, Titanic. Right. Let's talk about going further north. That's right. That's right. Yeah. And, and there's all, all kinds of Game of Thrones experiences in Northern Ireland um, <clears throat> and also connections to, you know, to the nations and regions of, of, of Britain itself throughout. So it's a it's a really exciting time in terms of screen tourism. And I do think that it's going to be a prime motivator when, when travel restarts. I, I, are you finding that the trend is for London still or are the Cotswolds and the English wine country, Scotland, Wales, are they getting a, a rush first? How is it working out? Do you know? Yeah. So I think the way that it shakes out, and this is this is even true pre-pandemic, that the cities are very dependent. The urban locations and destinations are very dependent on, on inbound tourism, whether it's from Europe, from us, from China, from Atmia. Um, it's, a, it's a very much a, the case where inbound tourism drives a lot of the visitor economy in the cities. The, the, the other parts of the country are, are definitely enjoying domestic tourism. So you'll see that the coast and countryside is really something where there's already a built up uh, path for domestic tourism. So we know that we have to do both. We, need, we know that we have to recover the domestic market and, and this go to London um, is a really great campaign that, that London and Partners is targeting the domestic travel to come back into the city. And, and then with our work, 
uh, escape the other day, and then what we do internationally, the combination of those three things is how we're really going to recover all of the areas in different parts of, of you know, the, the, the whole of Great Britain. And, and what might even happen, though, because of the, uh, the, the difficulties of getting, you know, going from one country to another, uh, Eng- England was a hop. Sometimes they'd hop to other European countries, and maybe now it'll be more of a uh, let's move around Britain. Yeah, well, it could be. Um, there, there are a lot of things in terms of consumer behavior. We're not sure what, how that's going to shake out. I mean, there's also been a movement away from the cities, say, in America, that people are not necessarily going to be working in the cities. And so what does that do to uh, connection points? So the hubs, you know, JFK is a huge hub. You know, will that be affected by the fact that, you know, 30 percent of a, a certain company may have remote working built into their their equation and, and folks might not be living in the city anymore? You know, so we don't know there. We also know that um, single single destination trips may be popular with with travelers. So, for instance, going to Great Britain as opposed to doing a Great Britain, possibly, you know, Paris, um, you know, Italy type trip or Spain. You know, we, we're finding that there's demand for people to stay within Great Britain because it's easier when it comes to standards. It's easier when it comes to understanding the vaccination programs and how successful they've been. So we think that is a potential opportunity for us to keep people within Wales, Scotland, and England on one trip, have them experience the whole of Great Britain, as opposed to maybe a multi part type trip that we might have seen in the past. Let's get the advisors now to start thinking about where to land their clients. What are the products that are out there? What's happening in Britain that they should be selling? Sure. Well, I mean, look, there's so much going on. You would you would think with the pandemic that things had the progress had stopped, and it certainly has not. There's a, a brand new Royal Horticultural Society garden in Manchester that just opened this week. It's called the RHS Garden Bridgewater. Now, this is the largest gardening project in Europe, and it's just outside of Manchester, 140, 54 acres for people to enjoy all year round. So folks may have known about Eden and, and about some of the other really incredible gardens uh, you know, that were created by Capability Brown and, and, and folks that are famous within the English garden community. Um, this is just a place, I mean, 154 acres, you just have to go and experience. The other thing about Britain that's really cool, and I've, I've found this for myself, is that you know, no matter where you go, you're, you're never more than 70 miles from the coast. I and found that around, a fascinating fact. Isn't that something? I mean, the word in front of great makes you think that it's quite vast. But in fact, you know, Great Britain is quite compact and you can be from, you know, you can be from London by train into into Cardiff and Wales in about two and a half hours. You can be in Edinburgh by train in about four hours. You can be just about anywhere in the country by rail in about four hours. And certainly if you're driving or you want to you want to do extended hikes and hiking opportunities, it's a great time. Uh, It's a great place to go. You know, this year, there's a couple of things going on that people will want to be interested or probably are interested in, I would hope, is um, you know, Scotland is ce- celebrating its year of coasts and waters, uh, promoting the activities and natural beauty around its locks and coastlines. Wales is also putting landscape in the spotlight and celebrating its castles and adventure products through its year of outdoors. And in England, the England Coastal Path is going to open this year, making it the longest walking coastal path in the world. So imagine that you can just walk from these, these various beaches and cliffs and seasides, seaside resorts if you really want to do you know, that kind of thing. And I love to walk when I'm on holiday. So it's a, it's a really, really cool thing. And then, of course, we've got some great new hotels that are coming in. And I want to tell you about one in particular, the, um, the Londoner, which is just a spectacular place. It's uh, the Londoner from Edwardian. It's going to be in Leicester Square. Square. It's opening, you know, next next month, I believe, and and it's in the heart of London's theater district. So the Londoner is being called the world's first super boutique hotel, offering five star boutique boutique hotel experiences on an amazing large scale. And in addition to the multiple re- restaurants, event spaces, and underground spa, there's a two screen Odeon Theater, Odeon Cinema, which is just so cool. I mean, it's old school. Odeon, it was on the property when they went to redevelop and the agreement was made with the developers to make sure that the Odeon cinema was retained. And so that's a really cool uh, thing to have as part of a hotel experience, in addition to the 350 rooms and 35 suites. So that's really exciting. We've already talked about the connectivity. Um, the other kind of cool thing this year is, is relative to uh, Coventry. This year, Coventry is a city of culture. And so they've just launched an outdoor installation where they're celebrating the, the year as the city of culture. You, you also have um, Birmingham, which is, is about to receive the Commonwealth Games, which is a major, uh, almost kind of quasi-Olympic event uh, that will happen in 2022. So lots of things in the lead up in Birmingham for, for Commonwealth Games. 
And then Liverpool, which is one of my favorite places. Uh, Liverpool is what, about two hours, I think, maybe an hour and a half by train from London. You can do it as a day trip or, or certainly go for a longer period of time. But you can see the famous Anfield football stadium, you know, Liverpool with its, its great red uniform and red seats. And of course, the Beatles fans can tour the Beatles Story Museum or a brand new attraction that op opened recently called Strawberry Field. You'll remember the song, but this is basically the famous garden and community space that opened uh, in late 2019. And so this gentleman was near it and he was inspired by it? That's right. He used to look, as a little boy, he used to look into the garden and this is, this is what he sang about in Strawberry Field. The other places that, I mean, I've been to several of these. I'm very lucky to, to have uh, taken advantage of time over there for business and extended a day or two to, to you know, kind of really learn more about uh, different places. So when you go to Brighton, uh, Brighton is, is a great kind of beach area that has this wonderful amusement um, pier there with, you know, with a, a really classic kind of arcade and a wheel and so on and so forth. Um, a great beach and just really wonderful antiques and restaurants. Again, this is a day trip from London. You're talking about within two hours, you can, you can do this and have this wonderful experience. Kent, which is uh, south of England, is known as the Garden of England. Yeah. Uh, beautiful region southeast of London. It has the famous White Cliffs of Dover, as well as some of the beautiful landscapes you can explore. If you wanted to go from Dover, you go over to the Channel Islands like Guernsey, where you might have read Potato Peel Society and want to go see where, you know, what that's all about. And then, of course, England's wine region, which sounds kind of strange on the outset, but England actually is developing as a really wonderful wine country. Believe it or not, Kent is on the same uh, geographical axis as the Champagne country in France. And so many of the French vintners have now taken up big positions within England and, and bought, you know, significant uh, footprints. So Tattinger is an example and are making the equivalent of champagnes in England's wine country that are beating the actual champagnes. Because as you know, champagne can only be called champagne if it's from the French region. But these sparkling wines are beating French champagnes in blind tastings. And I've been to one of them called Chapel Down, uh, which is basically in the area of Sussex. And it is, it's world class. It's as, well, it's as, it's as, as good, as cool of an experience as you're going to find in any winery in Italy or, or California or, or uh, in Spain. And, but it, what's cool about it is that it's instead of being old world, it's a bit of a new world of experience, a new world experience. So you have, you know, you have all brand new equipment, you have all, you know, kind of modern day processes, and you have a modern day experience within the context of, of having a wine experience. So it's really cool. It's so wild to think about. You think you know Britain, but then you go, it's, it's 70 miles to any beach, and it's the same sunlight coming in as, as, as the champagne in France. These are two things I learned recently. That's right. That's right. Yeah, and it's, and it's, it's, not, um, it's not just sort of uh, a knockdown experience. It's a world-class experience, if you, if you will. So these are all the reasons, really, we've almost answered my next question, which is, so you've got a client that wants to go to Europe. Uh, why Britain and why not other countries? Do you have anything to add to that argument? Listen, I think that Britain pre-pandemic and, and after pandemic is one of the world's top destinations, just replete with all kinds of attractions, culture, events, and things that would draw tourism and tourists from around the world. You know, we have, um, we have so much, in fact, to offer that it's hard to put it all in one, in one sentence or, or in one campaign. Uh, others have an easier story to tell. You know, you think of potentially Ireland, what comes to mind when you think about green and you think about all the great countryside, um, you think about Norway and you think about the Northern Lights. You know, that's, that's a simpler story than we have to tell, perhaps. And our story is very complicated because there's so much to offer between the built and unbuilt attractions. But I, I would say that we think that our programs of um, reassurance and safety have been second to none, uh, particularly in Europe. And we have tried to manage those programs in a manner that will give every bit of confidence to, to travelers. And for those that, that care, and I think many do based on our, our surveys, about having a positive experience, but also a safe experience, Britain should be a top choice. So now let's talk about the tools that you have for the travel advisor the resources that they could be using. Yeah, sure. I think that the travel advisors should really keep an eye on, on inbound travel requirements, such as the traffic light system. And again, you can go to you know, gov.uk in order to find the, the latest on that. And as I say, in about three, well, less than that now, it's about two weeks time, isn't it? Um, first week of June, we'll have another announcement on that. I know that there's a lot of interest on opening up that UK-US corridor. So we just want to keep an eye on that. And then, of course, you can always have your travel advisors reach out to our team, our trade team, 
um, I would encourage them to subscribe to our Visit Britain trade newsletter. You can find that on our travel trade site at visitbritain.com. And then uh, you, you can also find suggested itineraries and new products to share with your clients as they start to plan their first post-COVID trip. If they want to have an educational opportunity, we have a series of B2B webinars that are sharing insights from Visit Britain's research and talking to industry leaders in the UK in order to keep up with the latest news and plans for the year. And past webinars are also recorded and archived on that site as well. And then lastly, there's something we have which is called Brit Agent Pro. And this is a tool that really gives you a high level of, of uh, awareness and, and essentially certifies you as being a professional advisor for Britain. So Brit Agent Pro, you need to enroll there. It's a modular program. It's, it's, I would say, not a heavy lift, but it is very informative. And again, if you can put uh, next to your name that you are Brit Agent Pro certified travel advisor, that goes a long way when it comes to people trusting your knowledge and, and your level of ability when, when, when they're looking to book their, their Britain experience. And also when uh, they're looking to, to, to familiarize themselves and get some trips to Britain, this is where this will all be announced. They should be involved. That's right. Absolutely. Well, I couldn't wait to talk to you. Thank you <laughs> I'm glad we spoke. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm more primed to go to Britain than ever. And I <laughs> hope uh, the, the travel advisors have the information they need so they can go out and sell it appropriately. So thank yeah, you so for joining us. So do I, and I just wish everyone to, to uh, you know, be well, look after one another and, and the ones you love, and um, we will continue on. We will persevere. We always do. And this is Alan Fine for Insider Travel Report.